I will encompass you and I will accept you. No matter who you are, or no matter what affiliation you come from, or what background you come from, I will still be in a position to accept you and hold you. So if this is Allah's attitude towards his creation, that he wants to embrace them, and subhanAllah, when Allah speaks about the concept of embracing, what does he tell us? We all know Muslims of all walks of life, brothers and sisters, insist on the belief system in regard to the oneness of Allah or what we call what we call in a more professional way the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning the uniqueness and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah is non-dimensional right he has no borders Allah is not sitting on the throne huh Allah is not bound by the senses is not bound by you know the directions that we are bound Allah is beyond time and space some people cannot even comprehend the question of God being beyond time and space so one of his creation is beyond time one of God's creation is beyond time which is the Sun the sun does not know the night, brothers and sisters, right? To the sun, night does not exist. And that is one of the creation of Allah that is not bound by time. Can you imagine the creator himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He says, مَا وَسِعَتْنِي أَرْضِي وَلَا سَمَاوَاتِي Neither the heavens nor the earth could contain me. وَلَكِنْ وَسِعَنِي قَلْبُ عَبْدِيَ الْمُؤْمِنِ But the heart of my believing servant were able to encompass me. Allahu Akbar. But here there is another bold red line under the word that the heart of a believing person is able to encompass and contain Allah. Which heart is able to contain and encompass Allah? The heart that is free from hatred. The heart that is free from envy. The heart that is free from malice. The heart that is free from gossip. The heart that is generous. The heart that is giving. The heart that is accepting. The heart that is capable to show its humanity in the face of adversary. Like Imam Ali, salawatullahi wa salam alayhi, and the rest of the members of Ahlul Bayt, when they interacted with their adversaries, they interacted with them not on the basis of revenge, not on the basis of you kill me, I will kill you, you humiliate me, I humiliate you, you swear at me, I reciprocate. That is above the standard of behavior of Ahlul Bayt salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. And I mentioned in many of my lectures this most amazing story that happened with Imam Zain al-Abideen in which a man came knocking at his door and saying to the Imam the following words your mother is one two three and four and the Imam says anymore is there anything else he says yes and I remembered and she's this and that and then what he says bas bahot khalas enough I've said what I want to say he said then listen to me look at the response of the Imam he said listen to me if what you said about my mother is true then may Allah forgive her and if what you said about my mother is not true I'm gonna bury you alive no the Imam doesn't say that I may say that huh? some of some ordinary people may say that don't mess with my mom Huh? But the Imam said, but if what you said about my mom is not true, then may Allah the merciful forgive you. This is humanity at its best, where you can grow to a level of forgiveness and acceptance, even when you are the subject of injustice. Subhanallah. Even when you are the subject of injustice. If religion is understood from that point of view, 
then religion is a bless. And religion is something that a person should feel the pride in having and in entertaining and in accepting. Therefore, the importance of religion and spirituality lies primarily, brothers and sisters, in the moral and socio-moral aspect of man's existence. And the Islamic concept, therefore, of religion maintains that religion is not only a spiritual and intellectual necessity, but also a social and a universal need. And we will see why we need that particular need to interact within the corpus of religion. And here I'm speaking about religion in general. I'm not specifically talking about a set of religion. Though I am a Muslim and you are Muslims, but I'm talking about religion and the importance of religion in the wider sense of what religion entails as Allah intended it for this world. And surely the religion with Allah is what? Is Islam. But what is the meaning of Islam? Because when we say to people that religion with Allah is Islam, they say you are discriminate. Because Islam is something that we associate with Muhammad. It is not something that we associate with Jesus, Moses, Buddha, huh? or any of these great personalities that history has told us about. Oh, or Ibrahim, or Adam, or Noah, or Idris, or Jonah, or whatever the prophets or these great personalities may be. But when we say Islam interprets to be in a sense that you should be a submitter to where truth lies, then that complexity is broken. That complexity in the mindset of those who do not affiliate with Islam is taken away completely. Why? Because now you are saying the common denominator between you and me is what? Is to submit to the will of God. Is to submit to the will of God. And since I and you will submit to the will of God, then there is no question of discrimination. There is no question of discrimination. The question of me being holier than you does not exist anymore. The question that I'm higher than you and you are lower than me does not exist anymore. Why? Because before Allah, we are one and the same. Just like the Prophet puts it in the most eloquent of ways. People are like the teeth of a comb. You don't see the teeth of a comb one higher than the other, right? Because you start scratching your head and there is nothing worse than scratching the truth, right? Because truth is one. You scratch it, you get rid of it. Huh? And that's why the Prophet uses the comb, that the teeth are equal because if one was above the other, then we will be scratching at each other's skin. And that's what destroys the human race. That super, superiority position of being or feeling the, the audacity to think that I can be higher than someone else. So much so that Musa alayhi, was told by Allah once, go and find me someone who is lower than you. So Moses said, that's easy man, because I'm paraphrasing. Then, what's the big deal? Oh, of course I will go and I'll find, definitely I will find someone worse than me. So he went. He came across someone who's drunk. He said, you know, definitely I'm better than you. So he was about to bring him with him and take him to Allah. So he said, but maybe this guy repents one day. How would I say that I'm better than him? Leave him. He went. He saw someone you know, doing haram, doing zina. He said, maybe, definitely I'm better than this guy. He comes across and then he rethinks his position. He says, maybe Allah will give him hidayah and he will show his utmost tawbah nasuh and Allah will accept his tawbah. He may be ranked among the angels. He left him. He could not, every time he came across, he would think in what? In a positive way. Until he came to the time where he was about to meet God again. So he saw a dog. May Allah honor you. 
So he grabbed the dog, he says, I am definitely better than that dog. Then he said, no, God created it for a purpose. Lift it and went. God said, what do you bring with you, O Moses? He said, myself, Ya Allah. He says, by my majesty and glory, had you brought anyone with you, I would have erased your name from the book of prophets. I would have erased your name from the books of prophets. Don't think you can be higher than anyone. Again, Musa, salamullah alayhi. Because Musa is a phenomenon. Huh? Salamullah alayhi. He goes across and meets Iblis. This is a true story, by the way. He meets Iblis. He comes across Iblis. Iblis says, Musa, look, I'm tired. I want to repent. But I feel too embarrassed to come before God and ask Him for pardon. Anta Kalimullah. You are the one that spoke to Allah. Maybe you can become Rasta, you say, in your language, Rasta. You become, you know, someone that you can liaise between me and Allah. He said, are you really for sure, man? Have you lost your mind? He says, no, 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 I'm, I'm switched on. I'm 100% switched on. He said, what a day. This is really Eid. Because you know how many mu'min will come because of you? Okay, he goes, says, Ya Allah, your servant, Iblis. Which is true. He's his servant, whether he, we like it or not. Your servant, Iblis, wants to reconcile with you. And he wants to admit his faults and mistake. Allah says, I will accept him. But there is one condition, very tiny condition. What is the condition? He said, tell him to go to Adam's tomb and kiss the tomb. Just in admission of my command. Look to what extent Allah is accepting. So Moses comes down and says, he's euphoric. Moses Allah, is euphoric. He's full of jubilation. He got a deed of release for Iblis. And he says to him, fine, God accepted you. He said, Moses, don't mess with me, man. What's the story? What's the underlying condition? Is there anything that you're not telling me? He said, one simple, simple, simple condition. He says what? He said, go to Adam's tomb and kiss it. He says, I knew it. Man. This guy, I didn't do it while he was alive. I'm going to do it for him when he's dead. Arrogance. And that's what Allah says you should not entertain. Huh? And that's why sometimes we say, is it possible and feasible that Allah will commit people to torment? Yes, but it is not Allah that wants it. It's the human being. Allah says, surely we have not caused any injustice against any of them. But they were the perpetrators of injustice against their own self. But what have I got to do with it? Huh? Someone comes, where is God? There is so much wars. Is God sending battalions of Malaika with the AK-47 and telling people to fight one another? What's God got to do with it? God says, there is famine in Somalia. Why isn't God intervening? Why doesn't God bring man as salwa? You know that he gave to the children of Israel during the time of Moses to overcome the famine of Somalia and Africa. I say, you know what the problem is in that? The problem is not lack of wealth. The problem is lack of distribution of wealth. George Bernard Shaw had a sick white beard like that. And he was bald. Someone came to him, a journalist, and said, man, you're out of shape. How come you have a beat that big and bold? He said, look, there is no problem with production, but there is problem in distribution of production. Huh? There's no problem. <laughs> the deal, the hair is there, man. It's there, but it's the distribution that is bothering me. Huh? And the same applies in the human race. Brothers and sisters, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <clears throat> I'd really like to hear a bit of loud salawat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <coughs> 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 <coughs>
So the question at hand, brothers and sisters, is in how we will and are able to entertain and accept what religion is all about. And let me say from the outset, so that this is all a prelude to my lecture. I haven't started my lecture yet, brothers and sisters. Inshallah, over the next nine days. Let me say from the outset that if religion, in any sense of the word, is to restrict and curb the movement and the development and progress of the human race, then immediately you should cast it aside because it's not religion. Because religion, and the question is to all of you, is religion to serve man or man to serve religion? This is a question that we need to answer and we need to answer without prejudice. And the honest and most sincere answer in, in regard to this question is that religion comes to serve man, not man to serve religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ God does not make religion hard on you. But some people who are quasi maraja of taqlid and pseudo maraja of taqlid, they appoint themselves in a position and in a place where they become more stringent than the marja himself. I, I experienced this myself in front of a marja. I don't want to mention the marja. But he was being asked, what is your opinion in regard to one, two, three, four? He said, this is my opinion. Someone who follows that marja later on after the meeting ended, he said, no, no, no. You didn't understand what the marja was saying. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al -alil. We didn't understand what the marja was saying and you did. When you go 180 degrees opposite your marja of taqlid, just because you want to become a quasi marja and a quasi authority. And that's what brings us back and sets us away from progression. And when I say progression, I'm not saying liberalism. No, I'm saying developing to the highest realm of what constitutes humanity. And what makes humanity something that you can relate to and accept and be proud of. Just like Allah was proud of a humanity. It is Allah who said it and not me brothers and sisters. He is the one who said, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I want to create a vicegerent on earth. What is the nature of that vicegerent when the malaika themselves took what? Took objection to that. But their objection was that of questioning or inquiring rather than that of throwing away the proposal. So they said, fiha? Will you create in it, in this world, man yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku dima? You will put on this earth those who will create mischief and spill blood. وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ while we are the ones who are praising and celebrating your name, what did Allah reply? Again, look at the softness of the approach of Allah. He didn't say, who do you think you are? Oh, why are you messing with me? I am the Lord of the Lords. When I say something, it is. There is no question about it. No. He said, إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ he said, simply, I know things that you don't know. But later you will come to appreciate the meaning of having a vicegerent on this earth. Right? Because he is going to be a perfect role model for creations to follow. Because I have granted him a free will. Something that Allah never gave to anyone else. Not even to the malaika according to some tafsirs and according to some exegesis. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the malaika for a purpose and created them to worship him. So much so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he draws a comparison be between the angels and the perfect representation of the human being, the Prophet raises the level of a human being to a state higher than the angels. He said, وَإِنَّ مِنْ 
Then, wa inna min al mu'minin, and among the believers are those who are higher than the status of angels. Why, ya Rasulullah? Why? He says because a human being has free will. He has the ability to sin and to obey, to be good and to be bad. When the good and the uh, the potential not to sin outweighs his potentials to sin and be bad on the basis of his own choice and free will then surely he raises himself to a level higher the angels because the angels only have one thing in mind and that is to obey they don't have temptations huh? they don't have anything that tempts them like in Australia, for example, we had a television program, it's called Temptation Island. Australia itself, a Temptation Island. We don't need another program, for God's sake. The, the, the land itself is full of temptation. Now you bring another program and you say Temptation Island, for God's sake, have some mercy on us. Huh? Have some mercy on us when you are challenging our weaknesses. Huh? But to, even when we talk about challenge, brothers and sisters, as a human being, that challenge comes to strengthen you. Not to take away your potentials. Because if you are not challenged, you become stagnant. And you know, according to the rules of water, when you look in the Risala of, you know, Risala Amaliyah, they call it, when you go... The first chapter is about the chapter of Tahara, you know, cleanliness. Huh? They say there is ma'kor, running water. There is water that is what? Stagnant, rakin. It doesn't move. They say this water that doesn't move is not tahir. It's not pure. Why? 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 Look at the concept. Why is this water not pure? They say because it is not challenged. Why? Because sea water is challenged. It it goes and you know it turns. Rain water it what it turns, and a human being needs to turn by challenges to grow. Otherwise, his mind will become stagnant. He cannot go beyond the scope of his time. And Ali ibn Abi Talib when he speaks about. <coughs> When he speaks about interacting with our youth and our children, what does he say? He says, be mindful, O oh people, that they've been created to a time different to yours. What worked for you may not work for them. Huh? The dad used to come into the house, one look, everyone is under the bed. Right? Today the dad comes into the house, one look, he will get three looks. Huh? It won't work. Huh? It's not going to work. Why? Because they have been created to a time different to our time. Here it does not mean that religiousness and the code of religion has to be scraped. No, but it has to move with the time. And it has to be in conformity with the time that we find ourselves in without compromising on the original text. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to relate to Islam and religion to, or let us say religion for the argument for the for the for the uh, for argument's sake of the exercise that we are having at hand uh, for today. Therefore. We say from the outset, as I was mentioning before, that if religion comes to hinder you or restrict you, then it is not the religion that Allah has intended for you. As I said, because Allah said in the Quran, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made religion to curb your development. Then why do we have rules and regulation? Why do we have rules? I say that the rules in the Quran or in the prophetic tradition or that religion comes with, if there are sound rules as they were intended by Allah and the Prophet, they don't come to restrict, they come to regulate. And there is a huge difference between restriction and regulation. Because if I restrict your movement, I will give you a one-way road, Faisal road to Afghanistan. That's restriction. If I don't put what side roads, or if I don't give you the opportunity to chuck a U-turn, 
Then that is restriction. I don't want to go to Afghanistan. I'm going to Zainab market. Right? I want to come back uh, to Clifton. Well, you want me to go all the way? It doesn't, that's restriction. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, promiscuity is haram, fornication is haram, and stops. Uh, continue, bas, haram. So there is no marriage? Yeah, there is. Then that's regulation. That's regulation. That's not restriction. Because brothers and sisters, God cannot put an instinct in you and then crush it. Hmm? God cannot give you an instinct and not then address it. Right? It has to be addressed. But when Allah addresses a certain instinct or a faculty within you, He addresses it in the most purified of ways. Right? So He does not hinder your growth. No. He says, I know you from inside out. I know what you need. I know your desires. I know your temptations. I know everything that you... And it is funny enough, you know, with some of us Muslims. I don't want to go into the privacy of our own homes. But I say sometimes that even in marriage, we place restrictions. So if I am in marriage, I can't enjoy myself. And outside marriage, I can't enjoy myself. Then this is not a religion. Right? This is not a religion. Huh? Then I need to exercise every fantasy I have within my home. Right? Because God said, your women are yours and you are theirs. Right? As long as it is done within the framework of what? Of a family. Of a family. Allah says, go. Do what you want. Fulfill your fantasies so you don't have to look outside. So you don't have to become like those who are on the streets with a tasbih and a blonde comes and they say, you know, they're making tasbih, astaghfirullah, subhanallah, 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 and then the blonde comes, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. No! We don't need to be in that position. Huh? Subhanallah remains subhanallah. Huh? And astaghfirullah remains astaghfirullah. Some people say, you know, the question of hijab. They say, you know, hijab is compulsory. Yeah, we know, we're not, I'm not arguing against that. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is if a woman does not want to observe it, what stops you from observing your own intellectual hijab as a man? And if you look at the development of the question of hijab in the Quran, you would find that when God addressed the question of hijab, He addressed the question of hijab firstly and primarily on the intellectual level. When He said, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنْ يَغُدُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ أَنْ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُمْ And interestingly enough, brothers and sisters, that when the ayah was revealed, it started with the men, not with the women. Where Allah says, say to the believing men first to lower their gaze and protect their privacy. And then tell the believing women to lower their gaze because it's reciprocal. Al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat ba'duhum awliya'u ba'd ya'muruna bil-ma'rufi wa yanhawna anil-munkar Believing men and believing women are the protectors of one another. Allahu Akbar, they sit on the same pedestal. They sit on the same platform. Al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat. They both are the protectors of one another. What do they do? They enjoy what is right. And they put a stop to what is wrong. That's what makes them complete. Though they come from two different mindsets, from two different experiences, but when they are joined together, they enrich each other's experience. No one is higher than the other and no one is inferior than the other. And the most interesting of these examples is what happens with the Prophet because he's our role model What is the example I'm about to quote and I think I'm out of my time for tonight. The Prophet says what? He goes, brothers and sisters, and you are aware of Islamic history. He decides to go and perform Hajj, right? 
Meccans are not ready. Three years ago they exiled him and they plotted to kill him. Right? So the Prophet decides to go. Meccan says, look, we're not ready. Go back. Let's sign a treaty. Which is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. It's known. Right? So the Prophet, he says, okay, what are the terms? Terms 10 years of peace. Wow, phenomenal. You know how much Islam can grow in 10 years? You know? No battles, no wars, no dramas, no spilling of blood, no attacks. That is phenomenal. The Prophet agrees straight away. Some Muslims objected. Again, we don't condemn them for objecting because they didn't know. Huh? They didn't know what the Prophet is planning ahead. Sign the treaty. The Prophet, after signing the treaty, all the Muslims are wearing ihram clothes. Why? Because they came to perform Hajj. They are under the mindset that they will perform Hajj. So the Prophet goes out of his tent wearing his ihram clothes. All Muslims, as of this year, Hajj is not prescribed. You can't perform Hajj. Take your ihram clothes. Goes back into his tent. Ten minutes later, he goes out. The Muslims are still in ihram clothes. Why? Because the Prophet was still in ihram clothes. In the back of their mind, what are they saying? Maybe there is 5% chance that the Prophet will negotiate somewhere here and there. Right? Goes back into his tent, he says, take your ihram clothes. Third time he comes out, the Muslims are still in their ihram clothes. He says, change it, and I'm coming out. He goes in and he says, Halak al-Muslimun ya Um Salama. You know what the Prophet says? Um Salama, his wife, the gracious Um Salama, was the woman who was traveling, or Ummul Mu'mineen that was traveling with the Prophet at the time, because the Prophet used to take a wife at a time whenever he traveled. Because of his abundant equality and justice. She says, why are you saying the, the Muslimin may perish? <laughs> said, because they're not responding to the call of Allah. I'm telling them to take their ihram clothes and they are refusing. Um Salama says, may I suggest something, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet didn't say, woman. I am the Prophet and they're not listening to me. Woman! <laughs> As we say to our ladies sometimes, unfortunately, what do you know about life? No, the Prophet say, be my guest, O Um Salama. Go ahead. Tell me, what do you think the problem is? She said, Ya Rasulullah, may I suggest that you take your ihram clothes first and appear before them in civilian clothing? He said, Ni'mal mashuratu tilka ya Um Salama. What a great advice is this, O oh, Um Salama. Doesn't mean that the Prophet didn't know what to do. No, the Prophet is teaching us that when you marry a wife later, have a bit of respect for her intelligence. Have a bit of respect to her intelligence. Don't dismiss her intelligence. Don't say, woman, what? What do you know about life? You're good for the kitchens and the Louis Vuittons and the gold and what have you and the Christian Dios. Huh? Inshallah one day we'll get the Muslim Dios as well. As a fashion statement, you know. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So the Prophet changes his ihram clothes into civilian clothes. The riwayah says, the statement says, the Prophet comes out, he does not utter a word. The Muslims picks themselves up, goes into their tents, and they change their clothes because they saw the role model. He's in civilian clothes, forget it, there is no hajj. I told you there is no hajj. I told you there is no hajj. Leading by example. Leading, and how much we lack leaders by example. I'm not a politician. I don't like to talk politics. But I'm saying things in regard to what? To our own setups. At least. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salamullah alayhi. When I said I was going to finish, right? Uh, well, you have to get used to this statement, by the way. When I say I'm about to finish, it means another 15 minutes or 20 minutes. <laughs> so please bear with me. No, I won't take much more of your time, I, I, I promise, except for the time that has been allocated for me, inshallah. So, but just to, uh, honestly, sometimes when you come into a community, 
and you feel the affinity and you feel these beautiful faces you just don't want to stop you want to penetrate deep into your hearts and minds and that's what I feel at from the outset honestly and I'm not exaggerating we are in Ramadan and I will quote my learned you know scholar Sheikh Arif yesterday he said the devils are in chains I'm not lying because even if I want to I can't huh? because they are in chains they're not there to you know uh, come and unscrew some screws in my you know head as far as the language is concerned in any case Imam Ali salamullah alayhi, he says what in order for people to appreciate your humanity and trust me brothers wallah if anyone in the world asks me what is a synonym term for Islam Give me a synonym term. Yani Islam equals what? Give me, you know, when you go to thesaurus to find synonyms and antonyms, what would you find the word for Islam to equal? You will find one word, human. To be a true human. That's what makes you a Muslim. To be a real human. Like the Prophet wasallam was. Because you know what he said when he was asked to perform miracles? He says, we will not believe in you unless you bring down a river from heaven or unless you bring us some ayah that sticks out in the horizons or you bring God himself. You know what the Prophet says? He says, Subhanallah, hal kuntu illa basharan rasoola. He said, Subhanallah, was I not anything other than a human prophet? He didn't say a prophet human. He said, I was only a human prophet. Subhanallah, he introduced the concept of humanity first and foremost. People, he's telling them, the prophet, relate to me as a human. I'm a human, yes, but I'm revealed to, fine. But let us relate to one another on the basis that we are humans. And that's what the Imam, Salamullah Alayhi, he says that if you really want to be a human, then have this character in you. What is the character? He sums it up in a beautiful statement. He says, lead such a life that when you die, people mourn you with sadness. And when you are alive and absent, they yeen in earnest for your company. Allahu Akbar. Huh? When you go away, they cry for you in sadness because you were something. You were something, you were something that was so inspiring. People look at you and you feel comfortable. People look at us brothers and sisters these days and they were a bolt. Huh? In the West, if I walk in the street like this, <laughs> la hawla wa la. Huh? So what's this guy doing? Huh? Well, please, man, go back. Huh? Go back. I remember once I was walking like this in the street in shopping. Yeah. Uh, Maulanas do go shopping, by the way, brothers and sisters. <laughs> so I was going down and uh, uh, an Australian... Uh, young Australian was one. He looked at me and says, go back to Iraq. I said, are you talking to me? He says, yeah, go back to Iraq. This is not your country. And I didn't see him first. I looked back and I saw him with a mohawk. You know what's a mohawk? A uh, multicolored mohawk. I said, what's so wrong about me? He said, the way you dress. I said, have you looked at yourself in the mirror this morning, mate? Huh? Did you look at yourself in the mirror this morning? If you compare my dress to your dress, I think there's something wrong, brother. Two of his friends, you know what they said? They said, the man has a point. Honest to God, he's more dressed. He's neatly dressed than you. Look at your hair, man. And then we shook hands and said, no problem, brother. We are brothers at the end of the day. Let's understand one another. Let us sit and talk instead of vilifying one another. Huh? Let us sit and see what and how I can enrich your experience in life and how I can enrich my experience in life even if you don't affiliate with me on the same belief system. Because that's what the Prophet told us brothers and sisters. Seek knowledge even if you have to travel to. Why China for God's sake? Nothing links us to China. Different 
belief system, different culture, different tradition, different system. Why China? Two reasons or three reasons. That means if you have to travel to the furthest point of the world for knowledge, then it's worth it. Secondly, knowledge is the lost property of every believer. He must seek it from anywhere he finds it. It doesn't have to come from the same people like me. If it is knowledge, then seek it. The Prophet says, wisdom is the lost property of every believer. He is more worthy of it than anyone else wherever he may find it. Wherever he may find it. The Prophet says, Per chance, there is someone who carries a piece of information to someone who is more learned than him, but he doesn't have this particular piece of information. So I can use it and benefit from it. Thirdly, because the Chinese were known for their rich spiritual and mystic culture, which is the refinement of what? Of the soul. Huh? Well, the whole purpose of the corpus of religion is what? The refinement of the human soul. Subhanallah. So go and seek it. Go and fetch for it wherever you go. And the Imam Salamullah emphasizes that point when he speaks to Malik al Ashtar. Malik al Ashtar was the governor of Imam Ali in Egypt. He sends him to Egypt. Malik asks the Imam Salamullah. He says, Oh Imam, I'm going to Egypt. Egypt have Christians. I don't know how to deal with them. I don't know. I've never interacted with these people. They're not Muslims, they're not like me. And they have different religious affiliation. The Imam looks at Malik and he says, Oh Malik, people are of two kinds. Either your brothers in faith or your equal in humanity. What's wrong, man? What's wrong? They are your equal in humanity. Why should you differentiate in the treatment with them? Treat them as human. Huh? Treat them as human. When they come to you, reach out to them. Even if they don't come out to you, you reach out to them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not expect people to reach out to him. He reached out to them and sent them messengers. Subhanallah. But us humans have everything upside down these days. Huh? We want everyone to reach out. Why don't the West appreciate us? Because you know what? Let's face it. Because we don't appreciate them. Let us first appreciate something so that we can get something which is reciprocal. And I'm not saying let's reconcile all our differences. There are differences, right? That may be irreconcilable. But, but, sitting and dialoguing with someone is far better than creating that mistrust with that person. At least now you know him. You know his thought. You know his ambitions. You know his movements. You know his plans. You know what he is aspiring for. If you sit and you dialogue with him, you break all these barriers of communication. Communication. And the biggest problem we have as a human race, brothers and sisters, is the question of communication barriers. And in particular within our own families. Husband and wife, wife and husband, parents and children, children and parents. Huh? There's a huge problem in that department and if time allows me, I will also venture into these issues inshallah when the time uh, allows. I am past my bedtime. <laughs> inshallah we'll see these beautiful faces tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you happiness, accept your fast. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those when they listen to anything, they will follow only what is best. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين. The first question I'll read so that I will uh, be uh, truthful to the question. I may be out of context here and no offense to anyone, but many of our Ithna Ashari brothers who are married feel that they have a, right, a legal right to do the temporary marriage or muta as it's uh, written here. 
even at the cost of losing their own family. Our divorced sisters feel that they can have fun with married and single men in the name of Muta. It destroys lives and just reflects bad on our part that other people of different school of thought think we are crazy. Please do share some light on this point. In Islam, we are taught not to hurt someone's feeling, let alone destroying someone's life. First and foremost, I think we need to look at any legislation in Islam from its wholesome perspective, not from its narrow perspective. Diminishing something in lieu of the misuse of a particular legislation is not going to fix the situation. Yani, for example, if a jurist is asked if someone fasts but sleeps from dawn to dusk, is his fast accepted or not? The jurist would say yes, unfortunately. <laughs> his, uh, his fast is accepted. Though, though the practice is wrong. Yani you shouldn't, yani Rasulullah sallallahu says in khutbah of the last day of Sha'ban, that your sleep in Ramadan is an act of worship. But it doesn't mean that when Ramadan comes, I will say, oh Allah, I intend to sleep, so accept my fasting from me for the rest of the 30 days. No. You say, oh Allah, I intend for you to fast, not to sleep. But let's say someone abuses the system, as the situation in regard to this, right? What do we do? What we need to do is then institutionalize that particular practice. Yani it has to become registered. Huh? Number one. Number two, education about the pros and cons and how to administer such a marriage. Number three, number three, understand the literature of our imams and the practices and please i beg every one of you not to tell me i cannot compare to the imam yes i understand but the imams are our, our, our role our role models they are there for a purpose they didn't come as they are superhuman beings that we cannot relate to them no if we were able to relate to the prophet and the prophet said relate to me on the basis of my humanity then surely we can also relate to the imams on the basis of their humanity. Someone comes to the imam, Sadiq Salamullah Alaihi, and he asked him, what do you think about temporary marriage? He said, it's in the Quran. The imam says, will you do it? It's a challenge, right? Will you do it? The imam says, some legislation that Allah puts forward, not necessarily for us to administer it. But it is there for people who are weaker to administer. Yeah, and sometimes, and I don't need, I have a woman, I have a wife, right? Whatever I want, I go to my wife. I don't need to go to every Elizabeth, Margaret, and I don't know what, and, and you know, whatever the case is. Huh? So, secondly, and this is the most important of what I am about to say. If Islam does not address every single issue in the setup of the human race, then Islam is defective, right? As a religion and as a legislation. We have certain circumstances within the Islamic setup, right? That finds a woman in a position that she may not exercise any other avenue or possibility to curb and address, and we are all adults here, sexual needs and urges, except through certain faculties and avenues that Allah has made available. I'll give you a scenario. A woman comes to my office, divorced, 35 years old, all right? Three kids does not want to marry permanently. What does she do? Islam must find a solution. What does she do? Okay? She doesn't run after a married man. Okay? I'm not saying that. I'm saying to the sisters, find a solution for this woman. Okay? I'm not saying muta should be a license that we put in our wallets. Ah, what's the sigha? Wait, wait, I'll give you. Bismillah. Oh, iPhone. 
Zawajtu, Kabiltu. No. You know? That's not what we want. Huh? Like some people are empower our give them the sigha. Huh? Put it in their pocket because this is as useful as the driver's license. La habibi. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. We're talking about a setup of families here, a setup of, you know, humans, a setup of uh, 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 societies in place that we need to run smoothly in the vessel of life or in the ocean of life as we call it. In a nutshell, I say that the institute of temporary marriage has its merit. It was legislated for a purpose, but that purpose has been abused, greatly abused by some people in that regard. And I think we should not blame the system for allowing that, but we should blame those who misuse the system to their advantage. Number one. Number two is that, and this is an advice for our sisters, if every woman this is a bombshell, huh? This is a bombshell. Men are gonna kill me, and women are gonna kill me. But men more are gonna kill me today. If every woman refused to be woman number two, there will be no polygamy and no muta. Right? Uh, don't blame the men. Huh? Because when I find that in my position, when I have no other solution, a woman all of a sudden accepts to be wife number two, right? Because now that setup suits her. But if she was woman number one, no question about accepting woman number two, right? No question. And let me conclude my statement by one study that was conducted in Germany. Germany during World War I, wa the government of Germany was petitioned, petitioned by women in Germany. And this is a study that appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald. And if you want, you can go and Google Sydney Morning Herald and you will find that particular study in the archives of the Sydney Morning Herald, which is one of the most prominent newspapers in Australia. The study says, the women in Germany petitioned the German government to allow polygamy during the war. The German government refused. Women turned to, you know what? Unfortunately, after World War I finished, World War II finished, the same women who petitioned the German government to allow polygamy and failed in the quest to get a court order and they turned to prostitution, sued the German government and won the court case. That tells you what? That tells you when Allah legislates, He knows why He legislates. It is not just a haphazard legislation. It's not an ad hoc legislation that has no merits behind it. But it is practiced at times of dire necessity and not switching between here and there. Right? Well, today I feel a blonde, tomorrow a brunette. Let your wife dye her hair then, if you want this. Huh? If that is the case. You want short hair, let her cut her hair. You want long hair, tell her to put extensions. Whatever the case may be, now you can do anything under the sun. Huh? Let us readdress our marital relationships in the world we are living in. And let us address this relationship on the scope of Quran and the traditions of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt. So our children can learn to grow, learning what is the means and the ways to relate to one another from a Quranic perspective, not a cultural or a custom perspective. This is question number one. God help you until Fajr time. <laughs> Because the questions are, mashallah, lectures. Islam has given us to...
the permission not to fast during travel. My argument is in those days, it used to talk a very, it used to take a very long time to reach from point A to point B, but nowadays travel has become so luxurious and easy that it's not difficult to fast. So why skip, uh, uh, skip and later have the headache of making them up when we can easily do it in Ramadan? Well, the legislation of fasting and exemption for traveling is always looked within a narrow perspective. Yani now I am thinking about travel being so modern. But I'm not thinking about someone in the middle of the Amazon traveling or in the middle of Africa, right? Who does not have the means of a first class seat or a business class upgrade with Skywards. Uh, to say or to use that argument, right, that I don't have to break my fast because it is luxurious to travel in today's world. Let me ask you this question then. If I give you an option to choose between a straight line and a curved line, what would you choose? Straight line. But if I tell you that this straight line is going to be your eyebrow, it's going to be curved, right? Definitely because you don't want a straight line on your head, do you? What I'm trying to say is when we look at religion and its instructions, let us look in the wider perspective, not in our own or my derogative or my own narrow interpretation of what constitutes traveling. Because there are others who are not as privileged as we are not to have this exemption granted to them, right? It's an exemption because over the course of time, things change. They may even return to a time where the luxury of travel is no longer available. Because no one knows. In the economic situation in America now, people used to frequently fly between states. They can't afford it anymore. They're traveling by cars now. This is America we're talking about, brothers and sisters. America. People are hit financially so badly that they can't travel by planes anymore. They're, some, some of them are hitchhiking even. Huh? So to say that this luxury of travel is prevalent, yes, to an extent. But it is not across the board. Secondly, what you need to take into perspective that when Allah legislate, He legislate at the lowest of people's abilities, not at the highest. I may be able to sustain travel for 15 hours without any trouble, but another person may not have the ability to travel for 15 hours, even if he's in a first class ticket or first class seat and sustain fasting for 14 hours or 12 hours. He may not be able during travel to sustain it due to certain uh, 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 fatigue psychological fatigues emotional fatigue uh, 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 physical fatigue that a person who is weaker than someone else may not be able to sustain so Allah legislate at that lowest point not at the highest point at the lowest point not at the highest point. being Muslims uh, brothers and sisters why is it so that we are celebrating Eid on different days with different moon sight. Back to the question of whether it's moon sighting or moon fighting. <laughs> right? Every year, well, is it moon sighting or is it moon fighting? Okay. The question in regard to this and uh, inshallah we can reach a conclusion. It is not religion that is making that separation. It is the understanding of certain parameters from an astronomical point of view and a religious point of view. When put together, we face a dilemma in regard to the question of moon sighting. Some jurists are of the opinion that the reason why we celebrate Eid on a different day is because there are certain prophetic tradition that specifically state you need to sight the moon with the naked eye, which says so mulir uyatihi wa afturu li ru'yatihi fa in gumma alaykum fa atimu iddata shahar thalathina yawman. Meaning observe fasting 
to uh, for the uh, sorry observe fasting for the sighting of the moon and open fasting for the sighting of the moon but if you couldn't see the moon then fulfill the period of 30 days of the month and then next day obviously is going to become either the first of Ramadan or the first of Shawwal in that regard. Those who adopt that legal point of view, they are adopting this legal point of view on the basis of also strong scientific astronomical argument. Why? Because they say, is the horizon for every country the same as for another country? They say no. Why? Because when it is day for me, it is night for someone else. Okay? When it is spring for me, it is autumn for someone else. So it's not the same horizon. It's a different horizon from one another. Those who argue that the horizon is one regardless, they argue on the basis that we have one moon. We don't have a, uh, a trillion moons. It's one moon for the planet Earth. And when we recite in Salatul Eid, the dua, the qunut in Salatul Eid, what do we say? Allahumma inni as'aluka bihaqqi hadha al-yawm, al-yawm, al-ladhi ja'altahu lil-muslimina eidah. Oh Allah, I ask you, by the right of this day, day of Eid, that you made for what? For the Muslims, say this is one day, not two days, not three days, not four days. The dua says day. So the Muslims should all celebrate one day, one horizon. How can we resolve this dilemma? How can we overcome this problem? The only reason and the only way we can reconcile this problem is if we are able to reconcile the religious text with the aid of science. And that's what we need to basically appeal to. And with all respect, I say that with all veneration to our maraja of taqlid, that we should appeal to them as their muqallid to consider the strong proposal of taking the religious text and the scientific astronomical uh, uh, perspective into into consideration how how has as astronomy for the past 50 or 60 years failed in pinpointing the birth of the moon has it in 50s what does Sharia say in regard to that? Let us go to the original, original founders of the question of jurisprudence. The like of a Shaykh al Mufid, which is known as Shaykh al Ta'ifa. You know, the Shaykh of the entire madhab. <laughs> He's known. Shaykh al Mufid says, Ida kana huna katma'inan. If there is certitude and an aspect of tranquility and belief in the mind of a Muslim that the moon is already born and he has not seen the moon. Eid becomes valid for this mu'min. Because the question of utma'nan, question of certitude, is one of the factors of determining what the presence of the moon why you know why he says that because he's highly intellectual Sheikh al mufid because he says when you know for certain the moon is there then the moon is there you know why because it can't escape it has to be there it's not gonna run away right the moon is not gonna decide to take a holiday that day when it is supposed to born and say no today i don't like like coming out in the horizon i have decided to take leave no it doesn't happen it's ludicrous to even suggest such a proposal as sheikh al mufid says so he says even if the question of sighting is not present 
but you have certitude that it is there why you have certitude because you've already followed the month you've seen it towards the end of Rajab towards the end of Shawwal so you know when is the next moon is going to come and now with the aid of science and this astronomical advancing you know methodologies that at hand by the second they tell you when the moon is gonna be born then when does Sharia step Sharia steps into it and says what how long does it take for the moon to come out of the mahaq what is the mahaq brothers and sisters the mahaq is the is when the moon is between the sun and the earth that's when it is born right for us to see the moon it has to shift its position above the horizon so that the sun will not block its view okay how long does it take for this to happen how long 14 hours to 15 hours yes may Allah have mercy on your parents it takes between 14 to 15 hours so if no if science tells us the moon is going to be born on Saturday at 440 definitely by 720 I'm not gonna be able to see the moon right because it's only three hours old but by tomorrow morning which is Sunday it has already been what 15 hours I have certitude the moon is there but I can't see it then uh, Ramadan has to be declared starting I don't have to wait until Maghrib time then to see it that's how you reconcile between science and the jurisprudential uh, perspective of determining the beginning of Ramadan and the beginning of uh, the opinion of a Sayyid al khui for example, the scientific opinion of a Sayyid al khui rahmatullah says that the sighting of the moon by the naked eye is not a necessity in determining the beginning of Ramadan. It's not a necessity. Okay, the opinion of Sayyid al Hakim, the same. Okay, the opinion of Sayyid Sistani, may Allah preserve his life, is different to his teacher. He says, No, you need to sight it by the naked eye. That's where this the discrepancy starts and happens between the Mukallideen of Tayyip. Let's say I'm a Mukallid of Sayyid Sistani now. All right, and uh, there is a living marja today that is of the opinion, for example that says that you don't have to sight the moon with the naked eye but if there is certitude that the moon is born and you can't see it because it's still in that mahak stage between the sun but the following day it has already passed its phase where it is rising from the horizon but you can't see it due to daylight then ramadan becomes viable and it begins and you can fast can i do what Ruju? the question of going back to that marja i will quote the particular opinion of sayyid sistan he says if my muqallid thinks that this marja who believes in that point of view is at the same level of my knowledge and you have certitude about it go do rujo. i have no problem you know what some people said that's what I was referring to at the beginning of my speech. They said, ah, you did not understand what the Sayyid was saying. These are the quasi ayatollahs, huh? Uh, with all your... No, 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 you must see it with the naked eye. This is what Sayyid says. Ya Habibi, Sayyid didn't say that. He said, this is my personal opinion, yes. But if you believe that someone else among the Maraja believes that you can accept the astronomical, astronomical calculation and you use religion as well in order to determine the birth of the moon and you are satisfied, go ahead. Go ahead. That's how we can reconcile our differences. But if we're going to be standing at each other's throat, my marja is better than your marja, and your marja doesn't understand the opinion of my marja, and we will never agree on anything, brothers and sisters. And I think, with, I think with all due respect and veneration to our marja, there are not the problems. <laughs> huh? 
Sometimes we are unfortunately the perpetrators of these differences because we're not understanding the wide perspective and horizon from which they are addressing a particular point of view and we need to administer that ability to understand in a wider horizon so that we can join together and celebrate Eid in one day. Inshallah. Yes. I don't know any more questions. Okay. Tomorrow? Okay, inshallah. Thank you very much. Yeah. one question. Can we have the mic? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. How do you define the soul? The soul? Yeah. Now you want, Hajj? Okay. Yeah, sure. Very briefly, if you can. <laughs> okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about the soul, He's talking about the ruh, right? People came, asked the Prophet they ask you, O oh Muhammad, about the soul. Say, the soul is the command of Allah. The soul is a command of Allah. You are yet to comprehend Huh? What the vast knowledge that is available to you. you. You can't encompass everything. Scientifically, however, it's proven that is there a soul in the human body or not? We need to understand. We don't want just the religious perspective of the soul. Quran is telling us, yeah, I appreciate Quran. Allah is telling me, full stop, don't put a question mark. Yes. When Allah says this, don't put a question mark, put a full stop, because it's a full statement, right? But I need to understand and appreciate what Allah is telling me by the same token. Like for example, the question of belief in Allah, is it by virtue of faith or by virtue of knowledge? This is a question, brothers and sisters. What is it? Knowledge, uh, knowledge on what basis? On faith is on what basis? Who says faith? Yeah, and believing in Allah, is it based on blind faith or is it on religion, uh, sorry, on knowledge base? Knowledge, the sister said. Why? Because Allah said, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ What an amazing statement by Allah. You know what he says? He said, you must know and learn that there is no God but Allah. He didn't say believe that there is no God but Allah. You must know. فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ Ya Muhammad, فَعْلَمْ فَعْلَمْ You must know, O oh Muhammad, and subsequently the Muslim nation. But I want to know the ruh. Doctors made a study of a body that was given two to three minutes to die. They were observing. They don't know, but they know that this person is good. Immediately before his death, they weighed him. They weighed the body. Well, immediately after the death, they weighed the body. They found out that there is 100 to 200 grams missing in the body. Immediately. Now someone says, ah, it's, it's part of the human body that when it dies, it loses weight. Not instantly, according to doctors. Not instantly. This is instantly. And the doctors were bewildered. Where did these 200 gram disappear? Or 150 gram disappear? Some of them said, this is the soul. Some of said, we don't believe in the soul. But at least it's an argument. It's what? An argument. The question of whether the soul, or what is the soul? What is the nature of the soul? The Quran does not speak at length about the nature of the soul. But in our own understanding and observation of the Quran and what happens to us as a human beings and how we function, we can arrive at a little bit of a conclusion or inference of what the soul is. What is the worth of a human being after he dies? I'll ask any wife to keep her husband for five minutes in her bed after he dies. Although he was her Don Juan, huh? he was her, um, I don't know what, uh, you know, St. Valentine. 
right? Before marriage, uh, sorry, before uh, death. After death, every woman becomes marja of taqlid. Why? Because she says, bury him, bury him. It's the best thing the Prophet said. Right? Bury a dead person. The best thing to do to a mu'min is to do what? Bury him. Allah, take him. Why? Because his worth was on the basis of that soul. If it wasn't there, he's a frame. He's what? A skeleton. Like I tell our youth sometimes, I have keys in my pocket for a Ferrari. Take the keys and go and drive the Ferrari. Be my guest. I don't have a Ferrari, by the way. Okay, I'm just saying. The kid goes, that youth, he's full of adrenaline. Opens the car, sits in the driver's seat, and he wants to basically floor the car. Right? Floor the car, and he put his foot on the accelerator. The car does not move an inch. He's shocked. Goes to the... I used to make the mistake of saying that go to the front bonnet and open. There's no front engine in the Ferrari, it's in the back. <laughs> so I said, go to the back and open the boot. Open it or the middle of the car. There's no engine. What is the worth of that Ferrari? Zero. Zilch. And the worth of a human being in his, in his soul. Everything about a human being worth is on the basis of that soul. Even the connection between a human is on the basis of that soul. Take that soul away, you are a non-entity. Not you, please forgive me. Yani, I'm saying in general, the human being becomes a non-entity. If we understand then that the basis of creation is that soul that Allah interjects in the human being, we will come to an understanding that nurturing the soul supersedes nurturing the body. Because the body will be annihilated and the soul will remain perpetually. One of the creations of Allah that never dies, by the way, brothers and sisters, is the soul. But it's not a creator. Why? Because it had a beginning. But it doesn't have an end. Sorry, with this, I conclude. Wassalamu alaikum. Any more questions? I think uh, we're done.